we are live. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll give people a few minutes to show up um, before we start the discussion. But for those that are coming on, I put a little message in the chat on the side, just saying that we'd love to hear where you're coming from. Um, and then also to know what made you decide to come to this session today. So we have context for who we're speaking with. Can, can we can we start kind of talking about things that I think maybe are relevant until people join us? Sure, that works. How, how on the venture side, you guys see trends in this pandemic investments into uh, telehealth, for example, or any tele you know tele education, you know e, e learning, tele you know remote education and, and healthcare. From okay. our side, it's booming right now. Like all of that that actually can help to build you the whole infrastructure of working, learning, visiting doctors remotely. It's all booming right now. There's so many alternatives uh, and so many companies that are basically reimagined in the traditional way how we're doing that. That's at least that's what we see from our side. I'm curious to learn what you guys see from your side as well. So you see startups coming into you now that focusing more on remote. Yeah, types. like lots of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. On on my end, in terms of trends, a lot of what I'm seeing, as I'm sure you are too, Amir, um, and all of us, is just government recognizing the importance of having accessibility to internet and broadband and those services. So what we've seen in the United States is that even though there's been some counties, some regions, some areas that haven't had a lot of access to it, now when you have executives who have to work from home and different government leaders who have to work from home, they're finally recognizing, oh, like broadband service that's accessible to all is very important. And so I'm interested to see how that will enable more startups that Anna was talking about and others to scale even more and provide more services to people through that. Um, Cause yeah, it's really hard when you don't have internet access, especially when you're in rural areas to then get telehealth and all these other kind of key services that you need or even to stay online as your school has gone virtual. So that makes it a lot harder. Well, it's not even virtual areas. If you look at my LinkedIn, we're doing a lot of digital divide for families and children, even in Silicon Valley, 20% mm -hmm. of just Palo Alto. And you know, that uh, San Mateo County, is didn't have broadband. And so we wow. got CIS mapping for the children and families, especially the ones that are school lunch programs, 8A. They're commuting back and forth from different homes. They don't have a home and trying to figure out the various different solutions for them in order for them to <clears throat> get what they need. Even Comcast, they're giving out $10 Xfinity programs and half these families don't have credit cards and they don't wanna be liable for you know a reoccurring charge you know, and half the hotspots don't work. So how do you keep up track of the efficacy and, and yeah. half students, you know, performances? Because the parents also now need it in order to track how their kids are doing. Do, do you think that it's going to significantly push the 5G adoption? Because 5G is kind of substitute to internet connectivity, meaning you can connect via 5G now? No, I really think that right now it's all about just getting the technology to people based on terrain. So San Mateo has like mountains as well as, you know, city, mm -hmm. right? And how do you get it to rural or areas where buildings are in the way and mountains are in the way? So we look at various solutions to implement on it, but I, I think it's more of a matter of right now, it's already expensive and this isn't been a new story about digital divide. It's just becoming more prevalent because the kids are online all the time. And I'm a mother of, you know, four kids and three teenagers. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Even so, us, we have laptops. We almost have to have a backup dual recovery, right? Cause one kid's like, Hey, this laptop doesn't work. Mom, I'm like, Oh shit. I have to get one for each one of them in case. Cause they're all going to ask for my laptop. If it doesn't work at this time, it zooms more than Chromebooks. Yeah, you know the, the the other interesting thing about about the the kids is that they, you know, really they can be on Zoom with 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 their 
you know, the the the, uh, the the Mac, and they can be on the cell phone at the same time, and they, you know, multitasking, and and we see them expecting everything to work for them, and and uh, it's definitely not available. I don't know how come Mountain View, Mountain View, you know, it's my neighbor. You know, you're sitting with Google and Apple and everybody there. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Yes, Alexis. So to jump in real quick, we are about six minutes into the session and we have about 10 folks. So I would say we could actually, since we've already been having this discussion, we can start from there and think about you know, what type of infrastructure we need in our communities to enable more beneficial technology. Um, since we've already been having this discussion, um, Amir and Dow were kind of leading the conversation. So I'll let you both introduce yourselves um, real quick. And before you do that, actually, just so everyone knows for the 10 individuals, nine that are here now, um, is this is a session on reaching for the future of technology. And we're really thinking about this because all of us come from business backgrounds and long histories, you know, working to enable more equitable technologies. We're really thinking about it from how does business need to be restructured? What's the right infrastructure that we need? What's the right mindset to enable technology that builds a more equitable and sustainable world? Um, and so we're going to talk about this from different levels. We're going to start with Amir and Dow and kind of thinking about it from a broader societal perspective of what's the type of infrastructure we need to enable more technology to help build the future that we want. Um, and then we'll also kind of bounce around to different speakers and think about, um, you know, how do we need to be more systems leaders and think about the ecosystem of support that we're a part of for the businesses we lead, as well as, um, you know, what new business models need to be restructured? How do we need to think more creatively and flexibly um, when we're building businesses to, to adapt with times like during COVID um, where everything has changed very quickly? Um, so that's a quick overview of our session. And now I will officially pass it off to Amir and Dow to introduce themselves and carry on the conversation around um, how does infrastructure need to be adapted to enable more technology that's beneficial for everybody? No, you go. Thank you. My name is Dow Jensen. I'm the CEO and founder of Kaizen Technology Partners. We're an all cloud consulting company, uh, first woman owned US based cloud company in the United States. Um, and so what we're talking about is you know, we are as a company working on the digital divide and helping students in K-12 be able to get just the basic infrastructure. It doesn't discuss the content problem that we have and teaching problems we have with digital divide and distance learning as a mother of four. Um, but really, you know, it's it, as I was telling the, the panelists, even in Silicon Valley, we have San Mateo County having 20 percent of students who don't have broadband and internet. And how do you fix that when you're truly thought this was a three month problem and now it's becoming a 12 year, eight, you know, 12 month, 18 month or more problem. So Ramir. So yeah, that's exactly uh, what uh, is being, uh, you know, uh, confronted across all, uh, all uh, layers of society, you know, from the users to the providers, to the government, you know, local and, and, and federal, everybody suddenly realizing, unfortunately, because of this pandemic we got hit with, that, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, the world is not fair. You know, the, the ones that, that are lucky enough to have the money to bring in broadband to their home, and now are fortunate that they can get healthcare with telehealth, they can get education, their, their family can benefit from them, they can stay connected, but the ones that, and the majority of us, uh, they don't, just don't get it. And for me, as someone that's been focused for many, many years, especially the last 12, on democratization of education and healthcare, I find it, um, I, I, you know, if you want to find a silver lining in this terrible, terrible pandemic, is that suddenly everyone sees what we've been talking about for many, many years. We have to get, you know, we have to get this, this connectivity taken care of, especially for the less privileged 
that that uh, that needs it more than more those that can pay extra for everything. So uh, when we started, we focused on you know uh, communities of people that needed uh, trade skills um, like welding for developing countries and and uh, and uh, you know uh, different trade skills from electrician to all we 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 tackled. Uh, countries all over the world. We worked with a very large company that that uh, needed help how to do that. You know, a big welding company called Lincoln Electric. Anyway, the important thing was, and that's the key here. Suddenly today, when all the schools are closed and been closed for a long time, suddenly now everything is moving to remote education. Everything is now moving to remote education. Suddenly certain communities that were very lucky to be able to get a much a lower cost training system shipped into a certain community suddenly now they have to get it all remote suddenly now they need the internet connectivity and and now it's interesting to see the governments even like like uh, like we see today are being uh, you know pushing it forward and and even more important today is, is telehealth i pushed all my resources now into telehealth because so both mental rehabilitation specifically and and physical rehabilitation you know 50 percent of the physical therapists and occupational therapists were laid off and they're sitting at home ready to help but they can't because they're not allowed to go anywhere and even if they go into an institution that provides rehab they are told that only 10 percent capacity is allowed it used to be you know, uh, you know, it, it comes down to the point that telehealth is, is now um, is is needed, and and we see this trend across all the different levels of of society that is pushing it. And I think it's it's exactly where where we're gonna find ourselves, um, you know, over the next over the next year with escalated services that's gonna be able to help many more people. And from what I heard from you, Amir, and from Dow as well, is that what we're really needing right now as we think about what's the infrastructure that's necessary to enable you know, technology to be more accessible. We need more internet and broadband, but we also need physical technology. We need computers. We need you know, different tech that can be sent out to those communities. We also need training and education of how do people, I mean, what Dow you were kind of talking about before is that we um, need access to internet it's for people to be able to learn virtually. But in addition to that, we need to prepare the teachers to learn how to teach in that way and give them the space to do that. Um, and then finally, you both commented on, we got to focus on the most vulnerable because it's those individuals who are going to be left behind the most. Well, it's um, like children with, you know, tr uh, studying problems, you know, the ones who have ADHD, how are we handling that via distance learning too? And so the content's really important, but I mean, I love Zoom, but it's not the right platform for every type of teaching and training, especially if you're a musician or you're trying to do creative arts. You know, there is a lack of platform for the mm -hmm. right of education training and how quickly can we come up with that if this is going to be the new norm, especially hybrid for the next three to five years, the one, things we don't think about. And I have friends who are board of trustees in like Pebble Beach, Monterey, they're not forced to go back to school even when the vaccine comes out. So you're going to have to supply and support it because only 70% of the people are willing to take the vaccine if we're lucky, mm. right? And mm. so you're forced as a school community to have to give hybrid if you want to serve the entire community or we have to come up with options of other tar charter type schools, the taxes will go to those students who don't want to go to school because of their parents or them. Wow. Well, and I, I want to bring um, as well Bill and Anna into this conversation, too, because Bill has extensive experience helping technology companies go through you know, transformational change. And Anna is a Jill of all trades. She's had many different lives in a, in a bunch of different um, companies and starting her own and then also being an investor. What are you all seeing in terms of how to make this change towards more beneficial technology, more equitable because um, we, we're trying to do that now, but it's at an accelerated pace. Um, how are you all thinking about this challenge? Well, 
Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start on that. You know, I joined Lend Lease um, and moved from Silicon Valley to Sydney, Australia about 18 months ago, which gives you a different perspective because uh, Silicon Valley is a bit of a bubble. Uh, and uh, and moving there, you, you think start to think about the technology differently because not the whole world in, is uh, is Silicon Valley. And um, but I, I think what's interesting is in joining a company that's in property and construction, we're talking about an industry that has got the lowest productivity of any industry in the globe. In fact, productivity continues to decline while the rest of the industrial world goes up. It's also one of the leading let's say, contributors into, uh, you know, the, the global climate change in terms of, uh, you know, car net, uh, the amount of carbon produced. And then you add COVID on top of it. And it's interesting. We were going through a, a complete redesign of our, of our uh, strategy. And, you know, those things were all taken into account. So, you know, we, we decided we'd be net carbon by 2025, we'd be zero carbon by 2040. We decided we would hold ourselves accountable for 250 million of social value by 2025. And then you had COVID where we have to rethink our product because the residences, the residences now, they all want more office space or place to work and nothing was actually built that way. The commercial, they want the ability to work there sometimes, but, uh, but be safe but also work from home. And then retail, nobody really kind of knows how all that's gonna play out. So you're in the midst of rethinking urbanization simultaneously. And so all of this is really changing our strategy. But what we saw is that if you don't start to apply digital in a deep way to any of those problems, I'm talking about how we're gonna deal with sustainability, how we're gonna deal with the social aspect of what we produce, which means bringing the costs down so people can afford, you know, to live in, in these places. And by the way, make them healthier and workable. That the only way we see that we're gonna do that without driving costs crazy or producing too, more carbon is it's going, you're going to have to do several things. The first thing you've got to do is rethink your supply chain because you, we, have to make sure our supply chain is zero carbon or we can't be zero carbon. Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to bring everyone on that journey? And how are you going to measure that? Because saying it and measuring it are totally different things. And the only way is through the use of technology. I think the second thing I'd say is we've got to figure out how to bring the cost down in doing that because we've got to make it affordable for people to live in these urban environments. And so you cannot give up on the social to achieve the sustainable. You've got to do them simultaneously, which means we've got to rethink how we build. We've got to move away from this customized uh, everything being bespoke to get to more of a manufacturing style automation that the manufacturing world did 20 years ago to bring the cost down. And then the last thing is we've got to rethink design. And so when you look at it, we're thinking that the future is really around a technology known as digital twins. The only way we think you can do this is you have to model out your supply chain, model out your buildings, model out your designs ahead of time and understand their implications in those dimensions before you start to build. Because unlike mm -hmm. software, which you can change, I'd say the final thing is once you lock in a design, you're going to live with that for 100 years and going back and retrofitting is hard. So the most important thing is this idea of digital twins, and we'll really get this idea, build it before you build it. Build it virtually, then build it, and have all the details worked out. We think that's the only way that the cost, social, and carbon can be worked out. That's really what gets us excited, is that we think that's game-changing for our industry. I'm seeing Anna nod her head a lot. I'd love for you to jump in, because I know this is also your area of expertise. Yeah, absolutely. So basically to build on on what Bill just said, um, in terms of building before you actually build in, it's 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 very interesting how you have to think in the very beginning when you start the companies and like I'm bringing a little bit of investor perspective here. So when when you're in, an entrepreneur and when you're starting to build a company, you basically have to make a step back in the very beginning and think about how you want to shape your business processes. Because one, once it's live, yeah, exactly. You're stuck in that for 
almost forever, <laughs> one, like as long as the company is live. And right now there are a lot of areas, not only supply chain, but like any business process that we typically see in the company, they are all like business as usual. They are designed like as it used to be designed for many years. And right now what is, is much, much needed in, in, a, in terms to get closer to, to circular economy is basically to rethink all these processes, like supply chain, manufacturing, um, basically people management and many others to basically combine this social and environmental perspective because any business generates it by default. So you have to think about that in the very beginning. And to get some broader perspective on like to going beyond supply chain and like sim simply like any single process to reach the circular economy, they're like, it's, it's a very interesting question about like how do you actually do it and how you measure that. And there are like a lot of practical tools how you can actually do that. There are like very practical frameworks on how you can address those issues. For example, a very interesting one, the recent one that we were trying to implement as a baseline in the fund is this donut economy approach. So basically uh, it's the idea that inside of the circle we have uh, li like limitations social limitations like health food accessibility and stuff like that and on the outer circle we have this environmental limitations that we have like climate change like ocean acidification and stuff like that and basically the only healthy like layer for us like for humanity to live in general and for business to operate if effectively and socially and environmentally healthy is this like thin line that's why basically every business like has to think about like how we are designing those business processes from the very beginning to be mindful of how we affect all these um basically UN sdgs I think that's great. And um, I know Francisco had spoken about that a little bit before. I don't know. I know that his camera went off for a second, but when he comes back, I'd love to hear his thoughts. And Dow is yours as well around the need for flexible business models and creative business models. We need that more than ever because as Anna was saying, you know, it's not all business as usual. We, that won't function now. And it also wasn't functioning before. All the gaps that we're seeing because of the pandemic were there before. Um, and so we need new models to think through how to close that equity gap that we keep having and that keeps persisting. Um, Dow, do you want to speak a little bit as Francisco is coming back on the need for more creative business models to enable, you know, the type of change that we're looking for? Sure. Francisco, I'm sorry. Oh, we lost him for a minute again. Yeah. He's trying to come back on. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> so, you know, I think... Um, hi, Francisco. Hello. Are you here? You want to get started since you haven't a chance to talk yet? Yeah, and I, I can um, follow up with the question. Um, Francisco, I was speaking, we were speaking with Anna about um, the need for new business models to figure out how we can think through kind of a donut economy approach, a more circular economy to allow things to be more regenerative. The pandemic has exposed a lot of gaps and to, we lost them again. But hopefully it'll come back. My, um, my is, yeah, uh, generally, I, my connection is very bad, it seems. Uh, but if you listen, I can speak. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. So generally, we'd love to hear about your thoughts on flexible business models and the need for how business models need to adapt in the uncertain times that we're living in and past that. I think he's frozen. So I'll try to take I'll try to take in for a minute until he gets back. So Thank you, I think technology for technology's sake is wonderful, right? How do you get connected to people you typically don't get to meet and see? You don't have to get on a plane for 14 hours, but on the other hand, it shouldn't be default barrier to being able to connect with people. So as I had shared with the panel, uh, you know, after about a month or so into COVID and uh, shelter in place. 
there are a lot of clients and prospects who just said, well, I'm sick of what I'm doing. What can we do? And I actually went to meet one of my prospects out in the ocean. He brought a bottle of champagne and we started talking about, you know, after texting for 30 days and, you know, being worried about meeting each other. He's a government official and was taking his tests, COVID tests every two weeks just as part of his job. So, you know, you, you're leery You go out and you meet with them and you sit eight feet apart and you have the beautiful nature to remind you of like how insignificant we are sometimes. So I've been going to the ocean a lot and you just get close to each other from a very personal perspective on multiple topics. And, you know, in two months time, we closed a half a million dollar professional services deal with them. You know, just asking him, what projects are you worried about? And that's how we got the Digital Divide Project, actually. We do AI machine learning, but we never really went into infrastructure and helping children get K-12, you know, in K-12 to get their internet. And it was like, hey, that capability, and if you have a project manager, help us come and do that for us. And let's try it out, right? Um, and also recently, one of my art museum neighbors who's on the weirdest uh, show for uh, Weirdest Homes for Netflix has done, you know, his art his artwork and his people were not able to make any money. So they started building their art inside, of, inside the house, around the house. And so there was an exhibit and we take eight people in that are prospects and customers, all with our masks and we get together and we have drinks on the lawn and we have catering coming with our own boxes of food and we get to know each other. And I think you have to the people remember you when they're not able to see everyone else. I think that's a great reminder that the only constant is change. And so every business needs to become really comfortable with experimenting, adapting, utilizing more technology. Um, Cause Bill was speaking about this the other day with the innovators dilemma. You know, if you're just only focused on your business and not exploring what's out there, not being you know a little bit risky and, and trying new techniques, then you're gonna get left behind really quickly. Um, and it seems from everything that we've discussed, it's more important to connect with others outside of your business to kind of understand the ecosystem that you're working in and how to affect change there, as well as digging deeper to the root issues, which is now what you were kind of talking about with the digital divide. Like this isn't the work that you do every day with Kaizen Technology Partners, but it definitely enables more opportunities for your work down the road if there's more accessible for everybody. Right. And what you did even three months ago or two months ago might not be the only way you can do something two months later, right? So keeping your eyes open and talking to various industries, I'm on a WhatsApp with 41 different countries and 140 CEOs around the world. And you get construction, you have tech, and you have retail. And I think there's pieces of all the different industries you can learn to take into your business. And Bill, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on this as well. Um, similar to what Dawid was speaking about, but the need for that stakeholder approach for if you want to affect change, if you want to continue to grow as a business, I need to think outside of just your core business model and work with others to move the needle forward and stay, um, yeah, just stay relevant in many ways. You, you know, I think uh, just for for us, um, as we look at where what's going on, it if you don't, for example, the technology itself, uh, and I think a good point isn't going to solve the problem. You've got to rethink the process within the technology. The problem is the people who own the processes rarely really understand the technology. And the, and the question is, how do you see the opportunity? The second thing is the technology is very complex. I think for all the things we're doing, the you uh, we're so used to doing projects that are like big bang three year projects that by the time you you're done. You, you, you've got something you don't really want. You built a camel, not a, a racehorse. I think as, as we see organizations, uh, you, you've really got to figure out how you have the right talent on the technology side coupled with the business talent. And I think that is the inner, innovator's dilemma. It's easier to do it. In our industry, the construction industry, this is actually the number one problem because the reason change hasn't occurred is everybody's done it the same way. We still essentially build high rises like we did a hundred years ago. It's just that we have a few more motors that move things up and down. And so the question really is, how do you affect that kind of change in industries that aren't used to it? And why is that important? Because we can't solve the sustainability problem without rethinking technology. And I think that's really the thing that I look at is that you have to really be committed to making that shift. You've got to be willing to really 
have the organization get behind it. And you've got to bring these two tribes together, the digital natives and the digital migrants together to be able to work together. Yeah. So, so let me let me give you, if you don't, if I, if I can, Alexis, let me give you a, an interesting kind of a, a look from the perspective of a, a global company. Uh, this company, this big healthcare company that we work with, a company called Penumbra, that make trombectomy products. Normally, it's a product that removes blood clots from a stroke patient's mind, and then they wanted to provide rehabilitation behind that. What we found very interesting very early on, even before the pandemic hit us, that supply chain for from, from the global warming perspective, from geopolitical issues, you know, tariffs hitting China suddenly, we have to find other sources because nothing actually can work, not to mention delays and other issues. So what we found ourselves doing is taking a complete different approach to the project and product development and product and project planning. We found ourselves developing almost every critical component with multiple multiple channels, both from the supply chain and multiple channels to execute on the plan. And, and, and then hits the pandemic and adding all of that additional complexity of, of supply chain. Suddenly, you know, nobody can give a, a, any assurances on when and what we're going to be receiving. And, and, and the supply chain was like a snowball effect because somebody from Taiwan can really ship me a, a, a big major piece of the, of the product, but they, to deliver that, needs somebody from China and other places to provide them the pieces. And it became a very, very complex management. And then at the same time, we had to add the component of remote access for people from homes to connecting with people in in a, in in a remote offices like therapists and, and and patients and now in healthcare you you start saying oh just a second how are we dealing with privacy and security of the data when people are dealing with their healthcare at home it is not a very obvious thing so suddenly now we have this whole government thing now, the government side, HIPAA compliance, okay, how we are certifying it because everything we do requires FDA approval. So suddenly the FDA became part of the conversation and and, and everything became very complex. So flexibility, building your your business and, and, and from every aspect of the business, but even the product itself and the service itself, modular, so there is flexibility and, 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 and of where you get each one of the critical pieces. So you can provide a public company, uh, which is, you know, a public company, uh, you provide them the ability to project, you know, uh, future earnings as they need to. And, and, and Wall Street does not lose, lose confidence because of all this out of control aspect. So we, we did learn a lot over the past year. But even before that, we luckily got prepared because of all those other issues that came about. That must so, be come. So on that point, Amir, I'd love to hear from Anna and Dow as well on what does the future of business strategy look like if our products, if our models have to be increasingly flexible all the time? How do you build you know, a solid strategy and a long-term plan in a sense, if you can, um, what, what does that look like for you in, in both of your respective work as an investor and as a as a business leader and an entrepreneur? Uh, and if you'd like to start. Yeah. Okay, I can start. So uh, right now, the most crucial part for building this new creative business models for me is uncommon partnerships. So when basically companies are partnering together in the industries where it basically before there were no traditional partnership. And I can give you an example here. For example, a lot of um, 
a lot, a lot of talks right now are happening around the fashion industry, how it's like the second most polluting industry in the world after oil and gas. And right now we need to rethink how we basically use how we basically interact with clothes in general not only how we buy it but how we reuse it and many other aspects of it and right like and an interesting case when fashion company partnered with aerospace and defense agency because um they've already had this innovations um that makes uh textile more durable and make it last longer because they use it for aerospace and defense purposes. And it actually can be potentially used in fashion industry as well to make our clothes like last longer, like clean itself or not attract pollutions in the way it used to. And it's very interesting. So basically it, it helps us to think outside the box and think, okay, what creative solutions I can find outside of this traditional approach to run the business in my industry. So for me right now, it's like it's it's a very interesting aspect that I would encourage every company to explore. That's a great point. Remembering that we're not alone as like business leaders or businesses are a part of this huge ecosystem of many people. And we don't have to solve all the problems by ourselves. So I, I liked your yeah. point on uncommon partnerships. Down, yeah, you and there are a lot of innovations that are already there and you don't have to reinvent the wiggle. You can just like find the right partnerships. Will, uh, Dow, do you have any less thoughts on kind of how strategy might need to be adapted as we're encouraging more flexible, more creative? Yeah, I, I think in where we are today, you also need to look at other parallel tangential people who might have competed with you now becoming partners or cooperators, as I call it. Right. So our, we've doubled our revenue actually during COVID in a three month period for the year. Um, lucky to be in that um, space, but it, partly it's because of people who were actually selling colos are not selling as many colo and data centers right now and have come to us and said, we'd like to get into the cloud space. That's where it's growing. How do we partner with you and bring our clients who are hybrid and take a piece of that pie to stay, you know, to be a sustaining partner and keep growing during this hard time for our industry? And so we've gotten actually some really great referrals who they've been selling to this client for 10, 20 years, brought to us. They've never sold the cloud side, but we opened them up to learning it. One day they'll probably sell and compete with us. Who It doesn't matter to me, right? But they've brought us very loyal customers and our sales cycle has shortened as well as the size of our customer ba- uh, deals have grown on average. Um, and it's just because they've had loyalty. They know the clients, they know the decision maker, and I don't have to go through that whole process. So I think how you look at flexibility is not looking at people as always competitors. It's like, how do we work together? This is a big enough world for us to all own a piece of the pie. Well, and going back to what you had said before in one of your stories is it's, it seems it's really about having strong connections with others. Because if you have strong connections with other people, with other partners, you can be a lot more creative and adapt more quickly. And then it's also about being flexible throughout the process and leaning on other partners as you're developing your strategy. So, you know, strategy used to be 60 page plans. That would be for 20 years. We don't need that anymore. Now what we need more is to focus on our core values, on those connections, on those partners, on those people to have the good foundation to adapt along the way. And something um, you test short term, right? As Bill was talking about, it's not a three year program. How do I test and fail on something in three weeks or three months time and try again? Even as you know, we talked about Amir, the supply chain, right? Supply chain and monitoring and being able to see it online is one thing, but to call someone in the CEO in that supply chain and say, hey, I've got a connection with you and you need to fix it for me because of X, Y, and Z is very different than just being able to monitor and say, that's why I, you know, I, I have a problem. Totally. Well, so we are about um, six minutes until time. And I'd love to give the audience that we have here at least, you know, one or two options to have questions. Um, before we do that, in about three to five words, or at least a short sentence, we've <laughs> talked about a lot in this discussion, because we have such a dynamic group of panelists here. Um, so what would be your one takeaway that you want to leave the audience with? And again, in a really short, succinct sentence, if you can. And I'll start with Bill. So I, I think I I led with this technology called digital twins. I would say take a look at it 
one of the fastest growing consortiums in the world right now is the Digital Twin Consortium. It may sound esoteric, but in five years, everything will be modeled, everything will be real time, and that's how we're gonna solve a lot of these problems. Thank you, Amir. I would just focus on, doesn't matter which industry, what business you're trying to put together, make sure you have a remote tele-health, tele-education, tele-anything available from, from, uh, from, you know, from the perspective of being able to go to Anna and get her support financial support or business uh, advice and all you you will need to because every business is going to require that going forward from now on. Thank you. Anna? My takeaway would be like challenge the status quo of traditional business processes. And the second one, explore uncommon partnerships. And then finally taking us home, Dow. Thanks. So I would say turn things upside down, right? No matter how you're doing, no matter how good you are and doing well. I mean, we're doubling, but we're not satisfied yet, right? We think that there's a lot more to figure out on what we can do, how we can work with each other. So you always constantly have to be willing to just take a look at it differently in a different pivot, in a different way. And sometime, one out of 10, you're going to find that golden gem in investment. Thank you so much. Hopefully everyone who's listening, you know, captured all those great insights from the really robust conversation that we had. Um, we're all available to, you know, connect with you or at least answer follow-up questions on LinkedIn or at least through this platform. Um, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask, we have about three minutes to ask at least one question. You can do that via the chat or you might have the option to um, click online on the platform and ask any questions that you have. So I'll pause for a moment in case anybody has those. I think everybody knows everything. <laughs> We're all omniscient beings. <laughs> well, you have a oh, for the mic. I just gave it to him, I believe. Um, yes, except, okay. There we go. <laughs> Alexis, you're enjoying the technology, huh? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Gregory. There you go. Uh, Hi, Gregory. Uh, good evening um, to those up in the up in the north, um, or wherever you are in the world, um, and uh, good morning if you're in the south, where I am from New Zealand. Uh, quick question: um, It's really around uh, this new divide I see opening up between the physical world and the digital world. Um, those who are able to prosper. Uh, purely digitally, and those who need to um, uh, uh, develop a livelihood, um, and therefore I put the emphasis on, on living um, in the physical world um, and how we're going to move forward and operate um, uh, and, and where this is going to actually take uh, humanity and its relationship with uh, planet Earth, uh, the natural resources that we're dependent upon um, uh, to, to do um, our built environment, both in the physical world and the virtual world. Um, maybe direct that um, at William. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, look, I think... Um, you know, I actually have great hope. I see like in India, uh, the geo platform coming out that opens up India in a way that I think is going to allow them to play in the divide. I, but I, you know, in, in the end, what's going to have to happen is the, uh, you know, the first world nations are going to have to work together. You know, at the end, we're going to have to come together to enable everyone. We're going to have to find ways to lower the cost of connectivity. And uh, I'm hopeful that 5G actually can get us to where we need to go. The, the, the final thing is, I think that there are, um, you know, low cost devices and other things, uh, mobile phones. And if, as I've been to Africa, I see there's some of the best online wallet payment systems on phones and things like that, that I wish we had 
even in the US or in Australia and things like that. So when I look at it, I think, yeah, I have great hope that the technology that will allow that, what I think is the policies and regulations have to enable it. And that's a much deeper conversation. And one that uh, worries me more than anything is that's what's gonna get in the way. So great question. And I enjoyed your session before Gregory. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm so sorry that we're out of time, um, but for all those who stayed on this conversation and in the session with us, we really appreciate it because we know that we're wrapping it up here. So hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the networking during the Harassus Global Forum that Frank has for us afterwards. But apart from that, let's stay connected. And thanks, a huge thanks to the panelists. Loved all your thoughts. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank great. you. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Love meeting you. Thank you.